Welcome back. I'm looking forward to this next session around managing mental health. And it's a topic which is very close to my heart uh, and one which I'm glad we're discussing with the global audience. So I'm very pleased to introduce your moderator for this session, Petra Velsboer, mental health consultant and executive coach. And she'll be joined by Gabriella Kisoy, the co-founder and CEO of Cool Kibanda, Jeff McDonald, the co-founder of Minds at Work, and Nick Taylor, the founder and CEO of Unmind. So Petra, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for having us uh, here to discuss this extremely uh, relevant topic when it comes to the topic of mental health in our business. Uh, welcome to Gabriella, Nick and Jeff. Uh, I can see uh, some people are really enjoying the sunshine, which is a wonderful thing to see. Um, thanks guys. So I'm a mental health consultant. I'm also scaling my own business. So I've got my first couple of employees. And so I personally really feel and understand the strain, not just of entrepreneurship, but of course, within the times that we're living in. So evidence suggests that there are greater risk factors for us as entrepreneurs. Um, Nick, let me turn to you in the first instance. Um, how do you think the pandemic is particularly affecting entrepreneurs? What is this added layer that we're all experiencing in some way? That old mute button. Um, I, I think that the, the, the really the way to think about the pandemic on people's mental health is to go kind of back to basics of how we understand human mental health. And we have to consider the biological factors. So that's our, you know, our sleep, our nutrition, our um, gender, our age, our disease status, etc. We have to understand our psychological components, which are mindset, how we perceive the world, how we interpret the world, the kind of degree of control we feel we have, um, the degree of risk we feel we are under. Um, and then you look at the social factors, which are our finances, our workplace, um, our friendship network, our family. Basically, all of that is under threat as a result of COVID. Um, which means that's the biopsychosocial model, the whole person model of mental health and all aspects of that are under pressure. Now, if you think about specific to entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs have quite a high appetite for risk often because they're branching out to try and do something. But then normally you kind of, you're playing a betting game to an extent. You're saying in the, in the climate that I'm in today, I think this idea will work. Few of, any, a few of us, perhaps none of us go into it thinking, it will also work if there's a massive health pandemic and no one can leave their house for four months. Um, you know, that is an enormous additive pressure and it will affect so much of the working world and entrepreneurship relies on the working world functioning in order for young businesses to thrive. So I just think it puts additive pressure and therefore directly puts additive pressure onto our mental health. And I love that you say that, yes, we're in a way wired for risk when we jump into the deep end when it comes to entrepreneurship but we sort of don't factor in the, the sort of global crisis. Although we are often on a roller coaster of the ups and downs, the funding, the once we think we figured out one level, we're now at the next level and uh, we've got to start a whole new learning journey. Uh, Gabriella, if I could just turn to you. Now you run a, a social enterprise. I love your business. People, please do look it up and uh, look up what Gabriella does. But just let's get personal for a second. How has your mental health been impacted um, by running a business, but then particularly during this time. All right, thank you, Petra. So personally, I've been massively impacted. Um, I'm currently based right here in Nairobi, Kenya, and we're on the third extension of our lockdown. And so um, I've been struggling to maintain some sort of control, some sort of uh, schedule, rhythm, some normalcy. And um, I've had to deal with handling my team as well, not just my mental health, but looking out for other people as well. And so that's been a challenge. But um, what's been uh, specifically unique to my situation is that um, I've been struggling in between productivity and rest because every time I try to be productive, I think maybe I should be resting. Maybe I should be taking this time to sort of decompress and uh, tone it down. But every time I try to rest, I'm anxious and feeling guilty. I should be working. I should be handling business and not just uh, 
resting. And so I've been able to find a great medium between those two in venturing into productive rest. So focusing on work that's not related to my business, helping myself to concentrate all the entrepreneurial energy I have, but also resting as I'm doing that. I love that, Gabriella, because I think a lot of us relate to um, people who aren't entrepreneurs are often advising us to just chill out, just slow and down, just like take some time off. And I'm a bit like, you don't understand what we're going through, you know? Um, and I love, like I use the phrase active recovery. So um, getting away from my screen, um, going for that walk or, or researching something or reading something, using a different part of my, my brain in some way. How hard was it, Gabriella, to find that balance, though? Because I find I'm still a little bit doing that, you know? Yes. Um, I like to say some days are better than others. And that's just how we have to take it during this pandemic, during this uncertainty. Just one day at a time, because today I'll be, you know, focused and finding a great medium between the two. Another day I'll just be off work completely. And the next I might work. 12 hours straight. So it's just about taking it a day at a time and focusing on what you can control. I love that, focusing on what you can, can, can control. Uh, but equally with the pandemic and that level of uncertainty, it's oh. as if every week or every few days, it's almost like we need to reflect and review what our well-being strategies are because now we've got a different stage of lockdown or we're, we're hitting an endurance run as far as how you know, we can adapt our business or we're experiencing loss, whether it's, whether it's people, whether it's colleagues, what, what, whatever that might be. Um, and you also talked about supporting friends and, and like that has added um, exponentially to, to my life is other people feeling the need for support in some way. Um, let me just bring Jeff in on this conversation um, because you've managed uh, global teams uh, and within your, your, your own work, um, you effectively teach leaders how to lead what are some of the questions that perhaps leaders can ask their team or ways that they can support them uh, in that entrepreneurial setting uh, to support their mental health? Yeah, hi Petra. And uh, I just wanted to say a, a big thanks to Tom and Lena um, for what they are bringing to the world through Mission Possible. I just think it's wonderful what you guys are doing. So thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, talking about leaders and, and dealing with entrepreneurs, um, Petra, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think, I mean, during this time, um, I think that what followers are looking for from leaders, uh, and this is not my work, this is some work that's been done by Gallup, um, but, but they're looking for leaders who are bringing a degree of stability um, to the workplace, yeah. whether that's a large organization or a small entrepreneurial organization. So I think leaders have got to, have got to step up and try and bring a degree of stability. I think the, th the second thing that they are looking for is they are looking for leaders who are instilling trust. You know, people in these uncertain times are looking for leaders who they can trust. Uh, when they say something, they believe it, they therefore will obey it and they'll do what is the right thing. And so instilling trust, I think is really, really important. I think the third is about instilling hope. You know, this is a time when, when people are looking for that glimmer of hope. They're just looking for that glimmer of hope and being able to instill and provide that glimmer of hope, I think is really, really important. And then finally, and for me, the most important at this time, uh, irrespective of whether it's a large organization or a small entrepreneurial organization, I think leaders have got to be instilling compassion. They've got to be instilling compassion. They've got to be accepting that, you know what, it's actually okay not to be okay right now for all the reasons that Nick very, very eloquently described. And it's actually okay not to be okay. And to go beyond being empathetic, and show true compassion to people. And the difference between compassion and empathy is when we're compassionate, there's no judgment, and we prepare to take action in support. Whereas with empathy, there can be a bit of judgment and we don't necessarily take action. And so instilling that compassion, I think is so, so important uh, that leaders need to be bringing to their workplaces uh, today. And I would hope that this is an opportunity to reset and that we see more compassionate leaders into the future. 
I'm so, thank you so much. I'm certainly seeing leaders asking for more help and, and knowing that they can't quite tackle everything that's going on. I just want to touch on that piece about hope. What if that leader just isn't feeling very hopeful themselves? So they're, they're treading water, they're trying to um, do the listening and the compassion and all of that, but without fully having hope or, or resourcing themselves, how can they instill it in others? What are some things they can say or do? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think a great leader is a leader who is prepared to show some vulnerability, but with skill, but with skill, right? What is that? And, what does that look like? And, and if they're not feeling very hopeful, it might be to say, say, look, I'm struggling a little today, you know, be, be authentic, be open with your people, share a bit of that vulnerability to say, look, you know, maybe today I'm not feeling that hopeful. And these are some of the reasons why, but, but you know what, we are doing X, Y, and Z to try and improve that and create a better future or whatever the case might be. And so, and so I think, I think, you know, so often, so often, you know, we, we sort of position leaders as the sort of uh, macho can take it all uh, strong individuals. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> they're humans they have some vulnerabilities and to learn to share some of those, uh, but with a bit of skill so that you don't frighten everybody off because of course you've got a role to play in, in buffering some of the, uh, some of what you know uh, against the rest of the employees. But, but, but I don't think there's any harm in a leader, you know, sharing some of their vulnerability and if they're not feeling very hopeful at a particular moment in time to share some of that. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the, you know, the, the email that came from the CEO of, of Airbnb when he had to, when he had to say goodbye to some people. I mean, it was the most authentic, beautiful, compassionate message that he sent to people who are being made redundant. And if I'd got an email like that, I probably would have said, okay, I'll take this redundancy, but thank you for the compassion and the care you've shown in doing that. Absolutely. I mean, some people think that they, if they're looking after someone's mental health, that means they can't be direct and maybe say the tough stuff, but actually that skill, I love how you're talking about transparency, putting yourself in the loop, but also perhaps practicing with your peers, with other leaders, so that you can create that space to resource yourselves and then do it with, with more skill or, or balance when you're with your teams. Um, thank you so much, Jeff. And thanks to everyone who's already putting questions uh, into the chat box. We will get to those uh, shortly. Uh, Nick, I'd just love to come back to you if you just unmute yourself. Um, I know that your business has been expanding exponentially. I've been following the progress of Unmind, and of course I know some of you guys personally, um, and you're essentially scale, scaling. How do you manage adapting to scale when you're, you're, the, when, when you're working remotely, but also the, your team um, may be struggling with personal issues themselves now, given the pandemic? So yeah, um, so just, just kind of building, and just if I may, just very quickly on one of the things Jeff said that I think is so valuable. Um, is that kind of showing vulnerability? If you think in therapy, one of the most kind of well-known, sorry, I have a lot of things about to go off. Let me turn this on mute. One of the most well-known things for um, improving mental, uh, kind of helping people with mental health problems is normalizing problems. So in other words, making people understand that what they're going through is not extraordinary or different because nine times out of 10, it's not. Most of the time, it's actually quite similar to what other people feel. And I think leaders being vulnerable and showing that it normalizes for others that actually what they're going through is probably okay and normal as well. And that helps to empower people to feel more hopeful to move through, through things. In relation to scaling at Unmind, I think that... Um, it's been, it, it, it's a challenge, isn't it? Like we each, coming back to that biopsychosocial model, we each have a different social world, actually. And some people working from home for four months has been brilliant. For others, it's been really tough. And particularly some, I think, of the younger people in, in our team who are kind of maybe in flat shares in London without gardens, and you're getting up in the morning um, and maybe going to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, and then the next thing you know, you're at the end of your bed with your laptop. Um, that's really tough. Um, so I think it's about, again, being compassionate, um, about recognizing the difference amongst people and therefore the different experience that we're each going to have. Um, I think for, from a, a particular example of our mind, it's been an interesting journey. One of the things we did at the start of the health pandemic is that we opened up the platform for free to 1.5 million NHS workers. Um, and we're now one of the three recognized digital providers to the NHS, and that's still free. 
um, and will be for the foreseeable future. And, and that really helped the team feel very kind of engaged because it felt purposeful and we genuinely felt we were contributing in some way towards the health pandemic. And that, was the, that really helped us stay afloat in terms of hope and positivity. We went into the pandemic with, I think, about 37 people. Uh, today, we're just over 60. Um, so we've been growing fast remotely and hiring remotely, which brings a whole set of challenges, as you can imagine. And, and we've launched um, you know, t tens of new companies uh, over, uh, in, on a monthly basis. And that also brings challenges because we traditionally would have done a lot of face-to-face -face work um, in that time as well. So we've had to adapt to be digital. We've had to adapt to do things differently and, and adjust to, to being more dynamic and, and flexible. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to turn to one of the questions that has already come into the chat box. I'll turn to you, Gabriella. Um, and it, it follows on with you've got active recovery and sort of uh, learning to, to find your own balance. Um, I'm going to throw out because I keep hearing this on webinars that people are experiencing guilt, you know, either either the parents or the entrepreneurs or like the, the ones who have friends who are really struggling. I've certainly felt it with one of my closest friends who's been suicidal during this time like the, the divide between empowering them to access services, but equally trying to be there for them while scaling and running my own business. So we've got a, a question here, uh, Gabriella, how do you help yourself and your team, this is kind of loaded, stay motivated during the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, personally, I've been reminding myself and my team to go back to where we started, remember why we started the business, and remember what motivated and sparked the interest in the first place, and going back to our mission, and who are we trying to help, and because um, my entire team is just us co-founders, um, it's a great way to bond as well, and go back to how we came came about to this solution and how we came about to this passion for helping people in our own community. And so I think that's very important to remember your mission and why you started. And that will spark back the passion for what you do and a sense of instill a sense of purpose into your team and to yourself as well. Do you think it's possible that that um, that the why and, and why you started and specifically how you're delivering on that why could um, change during this time? So you, so you get that core of the why. I love how you're saying you fire them up. And then how do you kind of um, sustain that in maybe the reactive work that we need to do to stay afloat? Oh, that's great. Um, so our your why must remain the same, but how you go about it definitely changes. And especially in this uncertain times, I think um, we've been focusing on trying to view this as an opportunity as opposed to a crisis. So how, how can we make the most out of this situation? How can we push for more impact during this situation? So kind of turning around our perspective on is this really a crisis or is this a window of opportunity in which we can thrive in? I love that reframe because I think it applies to all aspects of our life uh, within mm -hmm. our relationships, within our living situations, like how are we reflecting and seeing what the opportunity is here, uh, even if it is simply to learn, to build our resilience, our character, whatever it might be. I see the most resilient people kind of riding that wave um, effectively. Um, Jeff, I'm going to turn back to you. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you guys for putting questions in. Please do keep them coming. Um, now, I know that when you struggled with your mental health a while back, and you do this, you, you tell your story in, in keynotes and, and all the rest of it, um, there was a time when you, you had to leave work um, because of your own depression and your own experience of poor mental health. Um, but I know that you also had support. So you had support of your workplace, uh, of your family. You accessed um, services and help and you were able to reintegrate into your job. Do you have any advice for people who might be struggling, but not, might not have that level of support to kind of get them back into work, or they might not have the, the luxury, so to speak, of taking that time away? How can those people perhaps um, do just enough to look after themselves during this time? Yeah, well, that's a really hard question, Petra. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> 
you know, people who've got no support around them uh, and are in the depths of uh, anxiety or depression. Wow. I mean, that's really, really tough. It's hard, I, mean, right? I, I think that, I mean, you know, support didn't say medication didn't get me better. Yes. It had a contribution. It made a contribution. Yes. Co cognitive behavioral therapy uh, had a contribution. Um, yes. Slowly getting back onto my bicycle and being active had a contribution in my recovery, but you know, the most powerful, the most powerful driver of my recovery, the most powerful, two words, love and hope. Love and hope. Feeling loved and being hopeful. And the only reason I could feel loved, Petra, was because I was very open about my illness. I didn't hide behind something else, a stress-related illness or I'd been in some dam in South Africa and jumped into it and got Bilharzia and then told everyone I had Bilharzia. You know, I refuse to be burdened by the stigma that is associated with, the, with those, that illness, if we want to call it an illness. And, 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 and by being able to talk about, talk to my friends, talk to my, some of my colleagues at work, talk to my wife and my daughters. You know what I got from them? I got the most unbelievable outpouring of love. And then there was one other person in my life at the time, a guy who'd been very ill two years prior to my illness, who'd been admitted to the priory. That's how ill he was. And I used to meet with him every 10 days. And you know what he gave me? I used to look at him and I saw he was better. He gave me hope. He just gave me so much hope that I could get better. And so there was a bit of what I call self-accountability to get myself better. And you know what? Love costs nothing. And giving people a sense of hope cost nothing. And when you lose hope, then everything is lost. And I suppose for me, you know, in an environment where there's no support services and where people, I would just plea, I would just plea that people actually turn to people that they know, that they love and share with them how they're feeling because what they will get in response is a sense of love. And I'm sure helping them to feel more hopeful about the future. And that costs nothing. Absolutely. And sometimes I know from my own experience of, of being depressed and suicidal ideation, um, we isolate ourselves. We feel shame about how we're feeling and we yeah. tell ourselves a story that we don't have any support out there. But actually, there are networks everywhere. And if we just are brave enough to take that first step um, effectively, we realize that other people are struggling, too. And I see this um, a, a lot in the entrepreneurial kind of startup space where we're, we might be competing for the same funding. We might be um, sort of wanting to show that we've got the upper hand and we're confident in our business. We really don't want to show weakness. But yeah. actually, it's those founders and co-founders in that level who really can get it, that get the loneliness at the top, can get that experience in some way. But Petra, you know, there's a, there's a lovely saying, Charles Mackesy, you know, we're all grown up kind of thinking that when we ask for help, that's a sign of weakness. Well, guess what? What he says is asking for help is not giving up. It's actually refusing to give up. It's refusing to give up. And we so often, we have this connotation around asking for help that that's a, kind of, that's a sign of weakness and that you can't take the heat in the kitchen. Well, guess what? It's actually refusing to give up by asking for some help. I love that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Nick, if I can return to you, we've got a question here. Um, and, and perhaps, I know there's so much out there, but perhaps name one or two. Um, somebody's asking what data is out there about global mental illness in businesses. Um, do you have just a quick fire round of some of the things that come to mind? Around kind of data? Yeah, so what data, I, I know there's some reports here in the UK, or where can people look to if they actually want to see the scale of the, the problem, I guess, globally? Yeah, do you know what, so, so there are lots and lots of um, kind of government publications, etc., that people can look at around prevalence of mental health, for example, in the workplace, thriving work, the uh, Stevenson Farmer review um, was, was really valuable at highlighting the prevalence of mental ill health in the UK workforce as equivalent documents in, in many countries around the world. Um, obviously the World Health Organization, big health bodies will publish things around this. There's a paper due to be published in, in the near future, which was pulled together by Tom Insel and his team. And Tom Insel is the kind of mental health czar for California, amongst other things. Um, and what they did is they reached out to many of the digital health providers during COVID and said, what trends are you seeing in your data? And many of us contributed our uh, data, anonymized data to that research. 
to, to show the trends. And it's really fascinating. Um, it is, it's going to be uh, coming out in the coming months. And, and perhaps that's something that um, you know, the team here could share uh, with any viewers that might be interested. But I think that that will be really interesting because it will be so timely for now and in COVID, what has been the impact on people's mental health. Um, I'm just trying to find the name of it for you, but I'm struggling, struggling to find it. That's all right. I mean, there's a lot of data out there. Of course, the UK has some reports uh, by the business, business in the community and driving at work that speak to some of the, the statistics. But I think more than anything, all businesses are waking up to the issue um, given the, the pandemic. Um, we, we've just got some, some comments coming through. Um, uh, there's a really powerful film called The Black Dog Video by the World Health Organization. Thank you for that um, comment. Um, so your, your comments, Jeff, have really resonated with some people uh, attending. Um, uh, Nick, let me stick with you for a second. So there, there's a comment or a slash question. I'm, I'll try and um, condense it. Talking about um, when we're with our teams or even friends and colleagues and we're, we're trying to look after people. So tr we're trying to check in. Um, there's a danger that as a leader, we can say, hey, how's everyone doing? Are you okay? What's wrong? You know what I mean? Um, and then what we end up getting is the like, yeah, life's hard. And we're creating space for conversation, but perhaps it misses that, that hope component that Jeff was speaking about. How can we ensure in our leadership that we're creating space for the tough conversations, but we're also leading in that uplifting way that allows us to talk about good mental health and what we're doing to look after ourselves and those sorts of things. What's your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great point. And, and I think for much too long a period of time, um, we've been talking about mental health as society uh, exclusively with regards to mental ill health. Um, mental health doesn't just appear in our lives when things go wrong. Um, we have it from the moment we're born to the moment we die. Um, it is one of the most amazing things about being a human being, having mental health. Uh, it comes from our brain, which is the most complex thing in the universe known to humankind. Um, it's unbelievably cool, the human brain. Um, our uh, mental health is our emotions, our ability to think, to communicate. It's incredibly important that we get people to talk about mental health in that broader sense, not just a set of problems. Because only by doing that will we actually be able to break the stigma. Uh, Jeff, you and I have spoken about this many a time before. Uh, there's a good reason that you sell Nike running shoes with a picture of an athlete. You sell a toothbrush with a picture of shiny teeth. Um, the reason is that it motivates people and they engage in the subject. I challenge anyone to go out onto the high street and sell 10 packs of toothpaste with pictures of rotting teeth on them. Um, it's a hard sell. Now, what we're doing in the workplace is we're saying, guys, we need to break the st stigma, talk about mental health, look at what a big problem it is, talk about suicide, talk about schizophrenia, talk about depression, anxiety. And this is a subject that people don't know very much about and it's really scary. And human beings, when they're scared, run away. So we're saying engage in this subject and we're presenting this terrifying topic. Um, and it's little wonder therefore that people struggle to engage. I think leaders have a responsibility to normalize the topic, to share their lived experience of problems. They are incredibly important. Leaders also have a responsibility to highlight to employees that their mental health is a precious, wonderful thing that needs to be nurtured and celebrated. And by doing that, we'll help break the stigma. And if I could just add to it around the, the comment around um, kind of leaders talking about mental health, for example, uh, uh, I think you've just mentioned, I think it's a massive ask to ask people to be able to have conversations about mental health. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've lectured at the world's top universities. I've led health teams. If a friend calls me up and says, I'm feeling suicidal, I still shit myself. That is still a scary moment. And it's still daunting to know what to do. So we need to actually say to people, it's okay. It is scary talking to people when they've got real problems because it does challenge us. And it's okay to feel a bit insecure in that moment. It's okay not to have answers. Um, it's incredibly important that we don't put too much pressure onto people saying, well, you've done your mental health training, so you should now be able to have this conversation. The fact of the matter is, you know, I can't remember what happened in the TV episode of uh, what I was watching three nights ago, because I can't even remember the name of it. And that had probably a million dollar budget to make the story as compelling as possible. I've already forgotten it. So we can't expect people to do training six months ago and remember what to do in the moment when someone comes with a crisis. And that comes back to this idea of compassion, that we need to be compassionate to one, about, one another about mental health, but also compassionate in our expectations of what people should be able to speak about. 
Absolutely, I love that. And really being able to practice curiosity and asking people what they might, might need or collaborating with them uh, to move in a certain direction can help. Now, there's a question requesting just some practical ideas um, about how people, what people can do to look after their mental health. So what I'd love to do just for each of you in turn is just because for the sake of time, your top two ways. So what are your top two non-negotiables? This is the way you look after your mental health and hopefully that will give uh, other people ideas. Gabriella, let's start with you. What are the top two ways that you invest in your own mental health? Um, number one for me is reaching out to help other people. So as a purpose-driven, impact-centered entrepreneur, the thing that sparks the most joy in me is sparking joy in other people. And so it's kind of a win-win situation where by helping others, I'm also helping myself. So that's- I, I love that. What's, what's, the, what's the balance for you though in when too many people or perhaps for too many hours are kind of requesting your time and your help? I just wanna make sure we got the other, the, the balance around that. Um, so for me, that would be boundaries and knowing when to fill up my own cup and when to fill up others because I can't fill up others without first filling up myself. So setting a clear boundary with whoever it is uh, reaching out for help for me, if I need to take care of myself first in order to take care of them, then just communicating that in the most appropriate way. I love that. Thanks for that. And what's your second non-negotiable that you use to look after your mental health? Oh, the second one uh, would be to engage my body. And I usually feel that when my body is healthy, my mind kind of tugs along. So whether that's eating better, that's exercising, reading, I think engaging my body really helps me to engage my mind and get some sort of clarity. I love that. Thank you. Jeff, what are the top two ways that you invest in your own mental health? Oh, just unmute. There you're so un you know, it's so unfair to ask us the top two because, um, I know. <laughs> because you know, I, I'm going to come back to, the, um, to where, where Nick started. You know, our mental health is driven, I think we've got to think of it in a very holistic sense. And so if I'm physically healthy, I've got a good chance of being mentally healthy. If I'm emotionally healthy, I've got a good chance of being mentally healthy. If I've got a good sense of purpose in my life, I've got a good chance of being mentally healthy. And so I think it's so important that we see it in that holistic sense. And so I'm going to leave the group with a very simple acronym that I use, and it's called CAN DO. CAN DO, C-A-N-D-O. And the C stands for connection. Just build connection into your life. Nature, friends, family, community. The A stands for just be active. Just be active every day. Just take some time out to be active. The N stands for try and be nice to somebody. Try and feel that you've got a sense of purpose. You've just been nice to somebody every day and see what that does to your emotional health. The D stands for discover, learn something new, be curious. And finally, the O stands for observe. Take time out during the course of the day to just have five minutes every two hours, just sit and observe and just be in the moment. And so for me, can do that little acronym is very, very powerful. If you ask me to choose two, it would be around observation, recovery, 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 taking that time out and, and being active. Those two are really, really important in helping me to maintain my, my mental health. But, it, but I can't just stay with two. I've got to go with the whole of can do. So there's lots that's possible. I love, we've already got comments so that people love that approach because there's something for everyone there. But of course it isn't a one size fits all. So there's a whole bunch of information and ideas um, but certainly it's kind of, let's experiment and try what works for us. Uh, back to you, Nick. What are your top two non-negotiables? Well, given that Jeff cheated by saying he couldn't just have two, I'm just going to take Gabriella's and Jeff's as well. I'll, Fine, um, let's um, do that. But, but I definitely think for me, gratitude is incredibly important. You know, daily, making time every day to be grateful for something. Um, I find that really helpful in kind of shifting my mindset because it's 
we're so good. Our brains are so good at focusing on the negative because we're naturally looking for risks to avoid. So we, we focus in on the bad things, but actually making time to notice the good things, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and for me, it's sleep as well. Um, and, and I say that as a parent of three children under the age of six and a puppy. So sleep is something I remember having, um, but, but I, do, I do really think that good sleep can have a profound impact on my mental health. And I just want to throw one in there as well, which is asking for help. And I think that can be incredibly hard. We're often as leaders there for other people in so many different ways. And I know that sort of is under the umbrella of connection, um, but it's taking that first step. And sometimes it is calling a, a helpline or um, asking, getting some therapy or some coaching or creating space to go deeper, to, to resource yourself. I always think people go to therapy when they're in crisis. But actually, um, when, I, when I got divorced several years ago, it was pre-divorce, even though it was my choice and I was like empowered and happy and all the rest of it. I thought change is a big thing. I grew up traveling all over the world where change was often thrust upon me. And I thought as a preemptive, let me talk to somebody just to make sure I've got my resources up in order to handle change. So sometimes we need to think about that prevention model of how we are looking after ourselves. Um, Jeff, let me turn to you because there's a, a question here um, we only have about six minutes left, um, but there's a question, what is your advice on learning to listen, particularly when it comes to being there for your family and employees as a founder? Any tips for just creating space for others, I guess? Yeah. I mean, let me, let me start by just saying, I think listening is the most powerful, powerful uh, support tool. Um, and, you know, we can't always be happy, but we can always appreciate somebody who listens to us. We can't always be happy, but we can always appreciate somebody who listens to us. And what do I mean by listening? What I mean by listening is true active listening, active listening. You know, how often does somebody tell you something or they come to you for some support and you immediately jump in and say, look, you've got to go and do X, Y, and Z, rather than actually first reflecting back what you've heard that person say. Because then, then that person feels that you actually have really listened. If you can reflect back what the person has said to you and then maybe offer a bit of the support or the guidance or the advice. And sometimes it's just about reflecting that back and just being there to listen to that person, but listening actively rather than it goes in one ear and out the other. So we can't always be happy but we can always appreciate somebody who actively listens to us. And one of the easiest ways to help is to, to being present is to put your phone down and to get away from your own notifications yeah. and distractions in order to fully be present with someone. Uh, we've got someone actually raising their hand. I believe they will be uh, put off of mute to, to as physically ask their question. El Marie, would you let us know what your question is and, and perhaps who it's directed at? Have we got El Marie coming on? If we just unmute. Hi. Hi, El Marie. Um, What's your question? Um, sorry, I think this was um, more of an accidental click on a, on a raised hand. Well, now's your but, time. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's. Um, uh, I wonder how much uh, attention is given by organisations and in leaders, uh, leadership training and development on promoting mm -hmm. emotional intelligence in in their organization i think if that is if there's a structured plan to really embed those principles and to really um develop the 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 leader's emotional intelligence because all the research shows that the higher the eq of the leader the more uh, you know successful relationships within that organization is and i i just think that that is something that more attention can be given to in a more institutionalized approach to ensuring that social emotional um, learning and even in your standards and your values that it's really being honored so that's just a, a comment um, that i can make thank you <laughs> thank, thank you thank you Amari. um any comment probably i imagine from nick and jeff just finally on what we can do structurally in businesses to create that longer lasting change and build that um, emotional intelligence. Nick, I'll go to you first. I think there's just, um, if you walk into, in London, if you walk into Foyle's bookshop, into the kind of wellbeing section, there are just so many 
brilliant books surrounding you and you look, it's demoralizing. You stand there, you think there's no way I could ever learn all of this. Um, but they're there for a reason, which is that there's so much information that we can learn about the human experience, about our own and that of others, that is valuable to know, to help us be better at being friends, at being listeners, at being uh, colleagues, at being managers. So learning about what it means to be human and the truly uh, wonderful and deep and complex part of our lives, that is mental health. I love that. Um, Jeff, we have one minute left. Will you close well, us on what you think? <laughs> well, I haven't got a minute because, uh, I mean, that's such a good question. Uh, let me just tell you, I think that what we should be building into every part of leadership development in every single organization all over the world is how do leaders look after their health? When you are physically healthy, when you are emotionally healthy, when you're mentally healthy, when you've got a sense of purpose and meaning, you've got energy. When you've got energy, you perform. You can do anything. And so we should link the health to the energy of our people and their overall performance. And when it comes to emotional health, one of the biggest drivers of emotional health, how you look after and maintain good emotional health is through powerful relationships, through good relationships and good relationship building. And so then we could teach as part of emotional health, how do we maintain good relationships? Let's teach people about emotional intelligence. But we need to, we need to shift the mindset around around the importance of health as a driver of performance in organizations. And by the way, COVID-19 has proved it to me. When people are healthy, nobody can perform. Economies come to an end. Yet most organizations treat the health of their people with one week called the well-being week, and then we move on. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, great. Uh, I want to end on this comment. This is by far my favorite session. I'm so grateful for this. Thank you to, to those who left that comment. Gabriella, Nick, Jeff, Thank you so much for your time and your insight.